Hi, I'm Neil Brennan. Uh, this is a podcast called Blocks, based on my Netflix special, where I talked about my blocks, things that make me feel like something's wrong with me, alone in the world, etc. And then I have people I know come on, and uh, they tell me about their blocks, things that make them feel alone in the world. Um, it, I know. It's, it's not, you're the worst. You're the, well, I, no, no, no. I'm sorry, I don't mean that. It's just okay. <laughs> no, it's not your bag, right, but right. I want to talk about it. I have empathy for it. I understand it. Yes. I mean, all comedians have some sort of flaw. It's what gets them through the day. You know, it, it, it's like comedians to go on stage drunk. If they do well, I did well, and I was drunk, and I did great. Or, well, of course I didn't do that well. I was drunk. You know what I'm saying? They, they always have to have that crutch. Right. The idea is when you can work without the crutch, you're actually much better off. I don't think you believe that Blocks was a crutch. That's what that just sounded like. Like the crutch being, I, what I'm talking about no, like I don't think emo. It's a, I, don't mean, I, don't yeah. mean, I don't mean it as a crutch. It's just that you can get around it. Yeah, I'm doing an hour now that's got nothing, zero Well, there you go. Emo like content. Say, you know, these are the obstacles in your path to keep, no, no. The obstacle is the way. Right. Yeah, that yeah. is the path. Yes. Yeah, that's that's what that's life a, is. Yeah, it's most of the path is yeah, just people this. say, I would have done this if it wasn't for this. No, but that's always gonna be there. Yeah. Yeah. That, we want to talk about I want to okay. talk about that. Go ahead. All right. Well, this is what he texted me one blocks air. This is Jay Leno, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, thank you. One of the uh greatest comedians to ever yes, do it. Yes, and yes, uh yes. and he hosted the Tonight Show for a couple couple years. Twenty two years. Twenty three. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. All things considered. Yo, Neil, just watched your special, and unlike many I see, it truly was special. Touching, funny, gut-wrenching, funny again, heartfelt, funny, three funnies. Everything you said was back with a joke. Every comedian that sees it can identify with every emotion you portrayed. No gimmicks, no tricks, just pure original thoughts that could only come from you. You are a comedian who thinks he's a writer. Writers can't convey pain on stage the way you did. Thanks for making what we do truly an art form. A loyal fan, Jay Leno. Oh, that's pretty good. No, I didn't realize I wrote that. But yeah, well, thank you. You got into the Vicodins and started texting. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, Vicodin. That's what I do. I take a lot of drugs. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here's what I'm interested in. Okay. In you, because I know that you're from a generation that is not squishy. Like, you know, it's a bit, what I do is a little squishy. It's like, you're from a generation where comedically, you guys were in hostile environments. Well, no, no. I I think maybe misinterpret it. I don't consider you did squishy. I consider it brave because most people don't have the ability to portray it. So it comes across as phony. You have the ability, oh, right. okay. you have the ability to portray it. So I believe you. Right. You know, it's like when I see someone playing a gay person in pain, it looks funny. When I see a gay person really projecting what, what it's like to be put upon, a, oh man, I really empathize with it. So that's the brave person, not the, the straight person. Right. But anyway, you know what I mean? It, it's the yeah. same sort of thing, if that makes any sense. No, well, what's funny is I, I didn't think Jerry Seinfeld would like three mics or blocks. And he's like, no, I love it. Why would you? Because I just assume you guys like pure stand up. But then, no, no, the stand up you do when you're playing the sand and gravel convention in Vegas, uh -huh. and you've got to get those job, and you're just you're bobbing and weaving, yeah, and you're boxing, and you're fighting, and you, you're still standing at the end. Oh, whoo, that's great, you know. And well, then, that's what that's what I was going to say is like the where stand up is now, there's more like latitude in terms of what people will watch. Whereas Jerry always says, like, he was like, you guys were opening for like Gloria Gaynor and like right, right. hostile. You That's know. right. If you, you're like, I made, when I was at the comedy store, I, I remember I said to Mitzi, because at that time, uh, Richie, we called him Richie. He was Richard Pryor. But you know him as Richard Pryor. No, they we, all called him Richie. We called him Richie. Yeah. Anyway, he was getting ready to do the first tape live at the Sunset Strip, his, mm -hmm. his movie stand-up, which was like one of the first people ever do that. So I said, can I go on after Richard every night, you know? Because then I would find out if something was funny. I mean, he would blow the room. People, ah, ah, and people, it, he people. was announced, right? It wasn't like he just popped oh, in. No, it was a was Richard a, Pryor show. He was working show. out, so people came to see him work out what he was going to do three weeks from now, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. And just 
killing the room. Just right. ugh, doing an hour and a half, whatever. And then I would go on and I realized I didn't have an hour's worth of material. I had maybe 18 minutes. But if, if you really counted what got a laugh after Richie. And that, oh, because you were just kind of not doing nearly as well. Right. I mean, I was, whenever I see comedians go, you know, I've been doing this bit for like years now. Well, get rid of it. Right. The fact that it worked once in Denver, well, that's great. Yeah. It's like a bad pickup line. Gee, it worked once with this girl in Cleveland. Okay, yeah, but that girl was really stupid and she was drunk. Okay, it hasn't worked with a woman since. Forget the line. Yeah. Just, do something else exactly yeah because you it's like <laughs> you guys were it they all the jokes had to work you couldn't be right right like emote there were there was not enough stand-up well, every six to nine seconds you need to laugh explain how because i was thinking about the the idea of making a living as a comedian mm -hmm. in the you started in 69 yeah it's good it's positive we're both sounding like it's sad like oh um, well it was different because then I was in Boston. That's 53 years ago, by my calculations? Yeah, which was sort yeah. of the height of the anti-war Vietnam demonstrations. Um, you know, every week the Boston Common had protests and stuff. So usually you would go on. A lot of colleges had what they call hootenanny night. It sounds uh -huh. funny. Enough, but it would be mostly, it was mostly folks. Stop your war machine, man. You know, and the theater would be like, uh, the stage would be dark. The people with flashlights click. Stop your war machine, click. And then they'd run over there <laughs> and say, stop your war machine. And, you know, all these sort of weird. Yeah. And then you're doing comedy. It just seemed in a, like, what? Hey, we're serious people, man. It, 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 so you had to try to get on, like, basically poetry readings. Yeah, you go on to poetry. It just, if you got a laugh, oh, my God, it was unbelievable if you got a laugh. It was, like, the greatest thing ever. And there really weren't a lot of people wanting to be comedians. I mean, I would go, I would drive to the Improv in New York. From Boston. From Boston almost every night to try and get on there. I repeat, Man. every night. Yeah, just about. Yeah, foot yeah. through four hours minimum. No, you could do it in two and a half if you put your foot in it. But this guy, this guy's been in two recent accidents. No one knows how. <laughs> yeah, go but, ahead. But um, I would drive the improv every night to try and work on because I'd get down there, and it was mostly Broadway singers. Mm -hmm. So Bud was okay. Three singers, then you. Okay, five singers because there just weren't people wanting to be comedians. Yeah. But I remember in the audition line, I met Freddie Prince. I met Richard Lewis. And then the idea of making a living at it, it how many people, I mean, there were 20 people making a living at stand up at that point? Depends what you call living, really. I mean, you're eating top ramen and. and Over 60 grand. Oh, no, not 60. 60 again, grand 60 fine. Million, whatever. Or whatever, whatever 60 grand was. What I know. used to do was I, go in, I used to go into bars in Boston that had music acts. And I put a $50 bill on the bar and I'd say to the bartender, let me go. We're going to do comedy. Okay, look, let me go. If I get laughs, uh, give me the 50 back. If I don't get laughs, you keep the 50. And I went through about a little under $500 doing that until a couple of times people went, oh, kid, that was right. Here's your 50 back. And hey, but you, the other come, 10 time or come, right. come, back next, come back next Tuesday if you want. Oh, oh thank you. you know, and and I, they kept the 50? How many people, how much money do you lose? I lose that? about like, about $450. And you, because you didn't get laughs. That's because, well, the bartender. Or they welched. They didn't think I was funny enough or, nah, kid, we don't want comedy. Thank you. You know, you get up there yeah. and do something, got nothing, you know. But after a few times of doing that, it was like, hey, here's a 50. But you want to come back again? All right, come back next week. No money, but come back. Oh, okay. And then you, you caught a bill. So there me. were just no clubs. No, there were no comedy clubs. It didn't exist. I worked strip clubs. I used to. You go on in between strippers at the Hillbilly Ranch in Boston mm -hmm. and places like that. I mean, I remember working with Miss Cow. Of course. And I Need a Man. Those are the two strippers. And I got friendly with two of them. And these were big women, you know. And they were all had shaved heads, but they wore wigs. And we, I remember we would drive out to, uh, was it Fort Devens? And they would put together a giant champagne glass. You know, they have like nails now. Ring, ring, ring. And they put this thing, they fill it with water. And then they would take a bath and I would I would stand and tell jokes. And they were very, they were like 40 and I was like 19. And they were like very protective towards me. So one day I'm telling jokes, hey kid, you suck. And I just yell. And she goes, shut up. And he goes, you shut up. And the stripper gets out of the tub and he grabs the guy, bam, breaks his nose. And blood all over the pool, all over the, all over the, champ, the, the fake champagne glass. 
and she gets back in the water and she's washing the blood off. And I'm trying to talk. To her. I mean, it was it was great. It was like <laughs> a wonderful the blood. Yeah, it was wonderful. At a strip experience. club. Oh, Some yeah. of the guys weren't turned on until she did that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so stand up wise, it was the Wild West. But Just, you have to understand if you got anything at all, you know the. Some, when I came to L.A., I realized, oh, my God, these people all want to be comedians, too. I had never met a comedian in Boston. Anybody else who wanted to do do this. So it seems so okay. you're the only one at the poetry reading who or whatever the, no, the there war were, machine there stuff. were two kids from Harvard named Franken and Davis. Sure. Al Franken. I Al Franken's him. coming and on Tom Davis, any yeah. week now. Yeah. And I and I remember meeting him at one of the oh, you guys do comedy, too. And, and and they were a little more intellectual and stuff. But it, but. But good. I was like, oh, okay. So that was okay. It wasn't like there wasn't anybody, but there just wasn't a lot. You just didn't meet, you know, a yeah, family of there performers. Was no, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you're doing it. It's a real like leap, leap of faith. Like I have to do this. I don't even know what this is. It seems like the whole. It seems like Pryor made a lot of money. Johnny, like Johnny Carson, Richard Pryor, like you know. The, oh, I wasn't thinking of making a lot. Alan of money. King. I was just thinking of just something about it you know it's like when you're a kid and you discover girls why do why am i attracted to that i i just am you know and the same thing with comedy it was like oh that's because i really i wasn't my dad my dad was a prize fighter he could fight and i remember he he taught me to box i was terrible terrible fighter and my dad said you know son i'll tell you one thing you can really take a beat and i went oh thanks <laughs> I, I i always told my dad was there so i always try to you just got the crappy then. I said, Pop, I'm not good. He goes, no, that's okay. I said, I'm proud of you. You know how to take a beating. Thanks, Pop. I appreciate that. How long were you taking beatings for? Well, not very long. <laughs> not, right, not, but not for very real, long. like six months, a year, uh, no, two no, months? It was when I was in high school. You know, my dad, come on. You know. Oh, you're talking, so he, you're not talking about stand-up. You're talking about this is before, actual fighting. This is actually fighting. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I mean, just getting the crappy then, you know. By your father? No, no, not by my father, by other by other fighters. Got it. You know, my okay. son had a... Because I couldn't bring my, I don't want to hit a guy in the face. You know, so I was going to say, if it was your father, we could do that one man show. That yeah, yeah. No, no, no. My to. father was great. My father yeah. Was great. Um, and ahead. then how long did it take you to have any semblance of a clue about stand up? Well, again, it depends what you call a clue, you know. Um, I used to MC a little bit. Harvard had a thing called the Nameless Cafe. And my, my college roommate, Gene Bronstein, who wanted to write sitcoms and stuff. We kind of hooked up as a team and did a little bit of that. So, so you didn't fail by yourself. And then I joined a comedy group, but they didn't want to work as much as I did. And I, and I split off and just went on my own from that point. But any place I could get on stage, I remember being booked at Playboy clubs and you get paid like $300 for a weekend in Kansas, but it was 600 to fly there. So I had a job at a car dealership and I'd save enough money to fly to the, and go to the gig and, and to make, you know, half my airfare to come back. But it just seemed like, what? And quit show business, you know? So it, I, I enjoyed it. It was fun. Yeah, it's a fun thing to be able to do. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. It's, so this life that you have now, mm -hmm. unimaginable. It was unimaginable then, but it's basically the same still. I still think the same way. Like if if I don't work, this week, I th I think I'm broke. I go, okay, I gotta get, cause I can't be spending money that I don't have. You know, I, but we, you we, we talk we used to talk about this with Seinfeld. This is the big thing. You know, I I always wanted to live on what I made as a stand up. Anything else was fake or temporary. So every Tonight Show check, I never I just put put in the bank. I, I want to live on what I'm. I make as a stand-up. I don't know if you know this, but price if you're up. listening or watching, the host of the Tonight Show makes a great deal of money. Oh yeah, it was uh, over uh, twenty million dollars a year back back in those days. Oh yeah, back in those <laughs> days, my best year was thirty-seven million dollars. Pretty good, uh, but that was including stand-up. That was including stand -up. oh so. But the best thing was, you know, I was with ICM, and they called me in one day and they said, uh, "Yeah, we're going to drop you as a client." And I go, "Why? What?" I he goes, yeah, you good. Yeah, yeah. I was opening for, you know, John Davison. He was doing all that kind of stuff. They said, you're just This not... is in 70. No, this is in uh, 80s. They said, you're just not the kind of guy whose name's going to be in the paper every day. I said, well, yeah, I'm not that kind of guy. Okay, so we'll, we'll just part. If, if a job comes up, we'll call you. Okay, thanks. 
So we broke off with that. And then, boom, two years later, I, I'm hosting The Tonight Show. So I saved 10% of a gazillion dollars. <laughs> it was fabulous. Yeah, it was four, uh, oh, yeah, it was f- 400 fabulous. something. Yeah. Yeah. All right, because there's a part of me that when I hear that, I've heard you say talk about the money stuff. And, and I go, is that like a I'm a regular guy, blue collar thing? Or is it truly like you viscerally are afraid that you're going to go broke? Yeah, I am a huge believer in low self-esteem. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the key to success. I don't want to believe in it, but it, unfortunately, it, I, it but, believes in me. Well, but, no, but I mean the idea that if you don't think you're the smartest person in the room, you'll listen. I mean, I so many people that get shows. Uh, put the, who did the light? You're fired. I'm doing the lighting. Yeah. Most people can't do anything. I like to think I can do one thing. So consequently, I have other things like directing and lighting. Just hire the best people you can and let them do their job. And that's what worked for me. I mean, when we did The Tonight Show, I had it set up. Anybody could pull the chain and stop the train. You know what I'm saying? Even What's if it, that mean? Debbie would get mad at me, a producer, because I would say, you know, one of the interns said they didn't like that joke. Will you stop talking to the interns? I said, well, let's, I mean, there are people watch the show. They have no vested interest. If they, if they think the joke sucks, the joke sucks. But that all, I, I see so many people get talked into thinking they're good by other people. No, the only people, you know, this is the only business where the uh, affection of strangers is more important than friends or loved ones Mm -hmm. because they're the ones that really keep the lights on. Yeah, keep the lights on, you know? So to me, if strangers and people don't like it, well, that's good, okay? Because you already have these people. They have a vested interest. Yeah, in and you're in, the, in that position. Yeah, yeah. You have to seek and, out and sort that, of and disbelievers and be like, "Do you? what don't you like about it? Yeah. And then go, okay, tell me. And yeah. they're a little afraid and everyone else is afraid. Right, right. But I, I always wanted it so they wouldn't be afraid. And, and that worked pretty well. That worked well for me. People told me, well, you you know, you weren't good tonight. It was really bad. What was wrong? <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. But I mean, don't you think that's important? Do well, you really want to be lied to? No, I, mean, I agree. No, no, but I'm just surprised. I used to hate the Tonight Show had an applause sign or a laugh sign. Uh-huh. And I go, was this funny or, or, or yeah. not? You know, because I would see there would be comedians who come on The Tonight Show and they do fine, get big applause. They do that same set in the club. Nothing. Just because it was predictable or there's, yeah. there's just something not spontaneous about it, you know? So when I go out and try jokes on the weekend, and I would bring those shows, those jokes back to the show Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they got a big laugh, bigger than the, the written jokes we had written that day because I had tried it, I'd worked it yeah. out a little bit, you know. And that's the thing because when you when you do a monologue that's written for you, you just read it, and people go to see you, they're like, "Well, this sucks," yeah, you know. And 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 by the same uh, thing, when I go out on the road, people go, "Wow." I, that was really funny. I didn't know you. I thought you just like talk to people at the desk. No, no, I do stand up. That's yeah. Funny. You know, so. Yeah. yeah, like that's the thing I can, can barely, the right, desk right. is like I can barely do. Right. Hi, it's me, Neil Brennan. You know, buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful, shouldn't make your life worse, which is why I'm here to talk to you about Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee. You can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have at insert event. Look, I'm curious about Taylor Swift. I may go through it. I may not, but I didn't want to bug somebody and I got to call this person and then I got to email my credit card to somebody. I barely, whatever, whatever. So go on game time. It's simple. It's an app. It works like an app. It's a good app. It doesn't feel fishy. Does it just feels like a good app, like any other app. They got images from seat views, which I actually like when I look at my tickets to see like, how are people looking at me? You hate to encourage procrastination. But Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. They got flash deals for football's about to start. Basketball just ended. RIP. Snag tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use B L O C K S for $20 off your first purchase. Blocks for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem blocks. For $20 off, download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, 
Lowest prices. I guaranteed. Okay, I want to get back to the money thing. Yeah. Are you actually, is there like a creeping fear that you're going to have money? Obviously, it's like a yes. dream or something. Like, you actually believe that it's possible you could run out of money. Well, <laughs> you know, probably not run out of money. Let's say, uh, if I go more than a week without doing my ex somewhere, I find I'm dyslexic, so I have nothing written down. So... I just try to keep it all in my head. Now, if I don't work at least once or twice a week, the stage is not a normal place to be, you know? But when you do it constantly, it becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. You know, I always used to try and do my act and write a letter with this hand at the same time to try and compartmentalize in my brain. I'd, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be doing the jokes. I, I used to practice by doing, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of the Sands, one nation. And then I'd read what I wrote and, it would. It, 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 the more I did it, the more it made sense. You were writing your act. Or no, you were I was writing, writing the some, pledge of allegiance. No, I was writing. No, I'm reciting the pledge of allegiance. Okay. While I'm writing about something else. Okay. And what this gives you as a comedian to me, when I'm on stage, if there's a guy over here talking, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, oh, it's it's a big fat guy with a red tie. Okay. As I'm, as the jokes are kind of falling out of your mouth, what can I say about? It? And then I, when I turn, what appears to be spontaneous. It's really something I've been thinking about for about a minute and a half mm -hmm. before I get, you know, does that make yeah, sense? Well, you of know, course. you know, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. That's a good technique. Well, you just compartmentalize your head. You just take, if you, you, you're, you're, active, you're, we're doing that anyway. Yeah. Your like, act is so familiar to you. Yeah. That you can literally fall asleep on stage. Wait, where, where am I? Where am I? <laughs> Cause it's just falling out of your yeah. head. Yeah. Um, so money you're not you couldn't possibly be worried so you just like working you like I, that's the thing is i, I like see you work. as just like you like just to work. i never asked what a, i mean i asked what a job paid but i never i whenever i see comedians go i'm not going there for 10 grand okay what are you doing on a tuesday yeah it's worth 10 grand mm -hmm. really, really you know i never yeah. wanted to be one of those people who turned down a job because it wasn't enough money that always seemed. Elitist. You're only getting eight grand for this. So. Yeah, yeah. This a, again, perfect. <laughs> what case. else could he be doing? Exactly. So, no, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, I never want to be that elitist. That you. Uh, well, no. All right. So you just like working. You you've always said like I need the money. I, and I'll all tell this. you what the thing was. I was watching Johnny Carson one night. This is the key, I think, to Johnny Carson. Dean Martin came on, mm -hmm. and Dean Martin, hey, you know, Johnny, you know, and Johnny's dressed in his sort of midwestern. This, you know, yeah, his Johnny Carson suit. Yeah, you know, he had his own line of suits. Yeah, Johnny yeah, Carson. but they were middle price. They weren't high. Yeah, they, and they, they were, were like J.C. Penney or Bro like what are they? One of those places. Something. Yeah, it wasn't. It was not like JCPenney, intentional. A little more upscale. Right, little. No, I mean, anyway, and Dean Martin, you know, he's just like the Italian singer, you know. And Johnny goes, oh, "Boy, I like those shoes," and they were Ferragamos. Now this is like 1968, and Dean goes, "Yeah, these shoes are 300 bucks," and Johnny. Whew, Genuinely, because I mean, that was a time when really good shoes were maybe sixty dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, now they'd be twelve hundred probably. Right? And I saw Johnny go, well, and right away everybody in the audience identified with Johnny. Yeah, you know, because Dean Martin was on this pedestal, and Johnny was the every guy. And whether he did that deliberately, but I don't think he did. I think he was generally surprised. I mean, Johnny drove a Corvette. He didn't drive a Rolls Royce. He didn't drive a Ferrari. He drove a Corvette. It's sort of an aspirational vehicle. If you're a plumber with your own business and you're really successful, mm -hmm. uh, well, you can get yourself a, a Corvette. You're I not, thought you were regular until you said $37 million. And then well, that changed exactly. your whole thing. Crumbled. There you go. I rest my case. Uh, no, but yeah. Okay. So it's you like working. Mm -hmm. It's not about the it's not about like i need to save this this pile of money and that pile of money you just like doing the job i like doing the job, and it's the thing you say instead of i like doing the job like i always say to my accountant look i work and my money relaxes okay I, you know hey, yeah. throw another a couple of grand on the pile and if the pile's the same a year from now perfect i don't want anything that has minimal risk <laughs> if the pile is exactly as high it was when i left fine if it's a little higher well that's great you're doing a good job if it's if it drops below we gotta talk. protect it yeah you just yeah okay so you're a comic you're a club comic you become arguably one of the strongest in the country in the early mid 80s right 
Arguably. Arguably. Whatever. Yeah. You're in the conversation. Okay, yeah. You and 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 it seemed like you always crushed at the comedy store and you were great. And um Well my attitude was when you get good someplace, get out of there and go to the next place. Go to the next place where you're not good and get good there. The comedy store was a great breeding ground, but it also became as comics, I think we're somewhat inherently lazy. You go to where you get the laughs as opposed to going to where you're not getting laughs. But don't, most people, I just go to this club because they, they like me there. You know, it's like in the old days, I just do colleges. I, college kids know me. I just do nightclub. Well, if you're a good comedian, you should be able to play just about any art. I mean, I booked myself into Oral Roberts once just to, <laughs> to see. I just wanted to see, and they give you, you know, no sex. No, you know, I said, yeah, fine. And they were fine. They, they laughed at political jokes. They, they were a good audience. They just didn't want sex or drugs. And sometimes it's, as a comic, it's interesting to put limitations on yourself to see, are you really funny or is it just obscenities or whatever, getting a shock out of people or whatever it might be. Okay, so you're, you're one of the, be arguably, one of the better, you're one of the better, stronger, you're a headliner. Okay. Then you start, he doesn't like any of it. Then you start doing the Tonight Show. Then you start, you're on Letterman once a month. Well, I did the Tonight Show, went very well. And then eh, a couple of shots weren't that strong. And then they weren't using me. See, the trouble was when you grow up, where'd you grow up? Outside Philly and outside, outside Philly. Okay, Chicago. so maybe you have this too. As a kid, I never called my parents friends by their first names, you know? Like when Giants, I still like consider my mom an authority figure. Like, right, right. Like, say you don't have to say Mr. Carson. Say Johnny. Well, it's just not. I, I, yeah. Well, th thank you, Mr. Carson. Jay, just Johnny. Okay, Johnny. I mean, I yeah. my natural thing is, and Letterman and I know each other for the from from the comedy store. In fact, Letterman and I got our star. We were writing jokes for Jimmy Walker along with Byron Allen. You know, so we would have these kind of things. and you, That's you know, a writing staff that's now worth. I know. Look at Byron. Byron's the richest. $1.9 billion. I know. That's he, nine. I know. I know. $1.9 billion worth of. I know. Nah. I know. <laughs> sure, but, he turned on most of the jokes. But Letterman was the first show where I could really be myself. Like, I knew Letterman got nervous before he went on. So whenever I do Letterman New York, I go downstairs. There's some Italian meatball. I get a, a huge meatball sandwich, you know. And I would say, what time does Letterman come down? Oh, he comes down at a quarter to five. So I'd stand by, right by the makeup thing. I have this, and I have meatballs, you know, I have sauce over there. And Letterman goes, oh, how can you eat? You're, going, you're on in 20 minutes. How can you, oh, don't, 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 you know? And he would go, no, I don't, I don't want any of it, you know? And he, I mean, it used to be very funny. And then I got to the point where I'd bring the sandwich out. They'd please walk into down. So oh, funny. Dave, Dave, you gotta try this. <laughs> no, and, and Letterman, he like, you know, the fun thing about Letterman is we both made each other laugh. Letterman is one of the greatest wordsmiths. The ability to say beverage instead mm -hmm. of drink, mm -hmm. you know, just picking the right word all the time. And with Letterman, it was always, the joke was always on the way to the joke. It was never the joke. I remember David said, what are you in California? You know, I was the old Manson place the other day, Dave. And, uh, you know, just seeing the gang. You know, seeing the gang, oh, you know, text. He's, he's still text, you know. And we, and we just, and, Letterman thought that kind of thing. So we just did that a lot. It became very natural and very funny because he knew my rhythm. I knew his, but we were the same age. So I could go, Dave, what, what kind of tie is it? I remember when uh, Dave was embarrassed because you know, he was on the cover of Success Magazine. Hmm. So I go, Dave, ladies and gentlemen, Dave was on the cover. Dave was, now he didn't know this. He goes, yeah, put that down. No, Dave, you should be proud of it. I said, you know, Dave, and I, I'm on the cover of Super Success Magazine. <laughs> it, it, it was twice as big. My fist race was twice as big. And it said Super Success. And, and then Letterman realized, oh, that's what the joke is. That's why he's doing it. And I mean, it was just so, it was the most fun I ever had in, in show. But I would do Letterman every month and just come on. And sometimes it worked better than other times. But it was just a spontaneity. And the fact it was the first time I could really, uh, Dave, nice tie. What? Look at the tie, you know, and and then he would be embarrassed, and you know, it was just great. Okay, this this that segue isn't what I'm saying. You, all right. So your Ooh. your your Letterman persona, your nightclub persona of the clips I've seen, like from the Comedy Store documentary, was like very masculine, 
and you're a b- fucking ball buster. Well, <laughs> by nature, it's like who you, I feel like you're most at home with like five guys just shooting the shit. Right. Yeah. And then then you start the Tonight Show, which you and, can't do that. Okay. You wind up you do that way you win the battle and lose the war. I was a comedian for the opening monologues and then I was a host. And there were plenty of times I'm talking to some some guest and I just going I I I've got the line. I just just let it go, you know. And I, it's the fat guy in the red shirt. Whatever. Player. I would just I would just let it go. Uh, okay. And I that guest would come back, but a lot of times it wouldn't go to other shows because they've been they have been made the brunt of the joke. You know, the, right. the trick is to know when to, like people say, oh, you watered it down for time. Yes, because the Tonight Show was, was watered, it was a watered down kind of, that's what it was. It was meant to go out to me. It's 11.30 at night. People are just going to bed. They want to have a laugh. You try to keep it as light and fun as much as you can. That was the job. You're hired to do a job. You know, I'm always amazed when I talk to meetings ago, I went to this, it was a Christian school and they told me to be clean. I just did all my, you know, filthy stuff and i go and what happened oh, they got mad really so what, what did you i mean if yeah you, if you don't want the job don't take the job in the first place but i always like people that that think they're iconoclast and, they're the, and then uh, no you're not you're just not doing the, if you don't want if if you're gonna make don't don't take the job if you don't like yeah. it yeah, did you know when you would guest host before but he would you would guest host on mondays and who who would write the monologue you and a staff or like Johnny's writers? Well, no, I would, I would write the monologue myself for when I was guest hosting. But if you have to understand how that worked, people were guest hosting because you were not a threat to Johnny. Mm-hmm. They weren't looking for comics that were good. They were looking for comics that were good enough. Good enough. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's another whole interesting thing too because there were a dozen guest hosts in the early 80s. Different people do it all the time. After all comics? Usually, usually. Well, no, sometimes it would be John Davidson or right. some person. Else. Second John Davidson reference. Right. Yeah, okay. there you go. Thank you. The, the listeners get a free taco. There you go. <laughs> there were a number of comics. They're all being represented by the same firm. And they called me up and they said, listen, uh, we can get $25,000 a night to guest host. Uh, that's what we're going to. That's what we're asking for our clients. And if you join us, we have a strong thing. I said, "Well, you know, I'm getting five hundred twelve dollars because that was scale." They said, "Well, we're going to twenty five thousand. Yeah. I knew Johnny owned the show, and we all got about the same ratings. So they put me on instead of the other guys. They would save twenty two thousand dollars, a couple of hundred thousand dollars a month. Yeah." So I became the permanent host. That was part of the reason. It wasn't the only one, but it was part of it because I didn't ask how much I paid. I said, whatever it is. And you just saw it as like a job, not like a, a job in a way of like, uh, there's this thing now where like, bring your whole self to work. You know that thing? Like bring your hobbies and bring your show and talk about your fan. And it's like, from my point of view, I'm like, I don't want to know no, any of no, this. I don't want to no, no. And so you just went and saw it as like, I'm not exactly being Jay Leno comedian. I'm being Jay Leno. Well, the great thing TV about the Tonight Show was I could be in show business without being in show business. I mean, I could be around it. So you're doing you're doing this as like a voca- as like a not a day job's the wrong word, but like separate from stand up comedian Jay Leno, well, right? It's separate from right. stand up. Yeah. Okay, comedians start making fun of you publicly. Ooh, hoo, please. Okay, tell me about like. Oh, yeah. Why do I care? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean. But isn't there a party that's like, oh. Well, there's a party that says, if you play football, who do you tackle? The guy with the ball. Okay. I was going to say your wife. Huh? Go ahead. Hey, everybody loves the comedian. Oh, man, we heard about your set. You bombed. That was too bad, man. Man, we love you. Great. Yeah, I love to watch comedians embrace the people who fell in front of them, you know. Um, well, because I there's a, that story from one of the books about how you used to tape everybody's Tonight Show set. And if they bombed, you'd be like, you want to come over and watch 
<laughs> oh yeah, we used to do that. Yeah, yeah. it was hilarious. hilarious. Yeah, Bob. Yeah. So you didn't pretend to be sympathetic. No, no. Well, no, I was also sympathetic. But that's okay. But if you're but bad, but you can be there's a reason you're bad. Right. You know, and the reason is obvious. You did the set five nights before at the improv, the, and it wasn't that strong. Why do you think it would be strong then? Yeah. Okay. So guys are making fun of because this. Is, I've heard stories of you calling guys who'd made fun of you. Yeah. On the phone, and that's 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 and I, hilarious I, and I don't, and very I don't, interesting to me. I don't yell at them. I I don't get mad because I did the same thing. I was you know I was making fun of guys too. Right. So I was just curious how it was from the other side. I remember one guy said, "Now I'm not I'm do Leno, but I'm just do Leno." I, I said, "So I call this guy and I go, look." It's fine. You don't like me. That's fine. You don't know me, so it doesn't offend me that you don't like me. But there are t two shows. There's Letterman's show and there's Leno's show. Now, assuming you kill on Letterman, and it's unbelievable, you'll get asked back all the time. But if you go on Letterman, it's not that good, and they don't like you, where do you go? Yeah. Uh, do you want to do my show at some point? Well, yeah. You, you can do it. It's okay. It's, it's fine. But just be prepared for the consequences. You know, don't make it so personal. I mean, if you trash something that I do that didn't work, that's fine. If you say I'm a horrible person, it's like, well, that's a whole different right, thing. But like, if you I remember really, Hicks had a bit about you. And I and then I found out you knew, I was like, he knew. You know what, here's the thing. I met Hicks when he was 14. Mm -hmm. And I was down there and wanted to talk to comedians. And, and Nick Hicks gets up and walks out of the room. I didn't know who he was, but I you, said, they asked you. The, the club asked you to come and talk to some of the up and comers. Yeah, yeah. You walk in, you're talking and to someone said, who's a 14 year old. It was Bill Hicks. Yeah, and, and I, he walked out. Right. And I said to the guy at the club, I said, I don't know who that kid is, but I'm sure he's the funny. Is he the funniest one here? And he goes, Yeah, he's really funny. Because well, he's pissed because he's better than me, and that's fine. And and you have to believe it, whether it's true or not. Yeah. So I got to be really good friends with Hicks and his parents. And I gave him advice. And some he took and some he didn't. But much like any sort of parent kid situation, you begin to resent. Yeah. You know? It and sounds like he resented you from the minute go. <laughs> no, not from the minute go. Not okay. from the minute go. Because I was still friends with his, you know, I was. Friends no, but when from he was 14. I was friends like, with his parents. Got it. No, he, here's what happened. He called, he wanted to come on the Tonight Show and do his Jesus thing. Mm -hmm. I, I remember, you know. yeah. and at the time that was considered, you know, you can't, yeah. you know. And I said, you know, they'll just edit it. No, screw you, I can, I can do it on Letterman, let me do it. I go, it's not me not letting you do it, okay? It's a censor. I'll let you do it, they'll cut it up. No, they F you, and they just, he was just furious at me. Then he went on all shows he's doing it on Letterman. And of course they edited it too. They, yeah. they cut, cut it all up. Yeah. And then, oh, he kind of backtracked with me a little bit. I said, all right, it's fine. You know, I'm the bad guy here. You know, he, he didn't like that I was selling out by doing the Tonight Show. I think I was doing some Dorito commercials. We're in a sellout business, you know? I mean, I'm sorry, you go on TV, is that a sellout? I don't know. It's just like to what? But yeah, I always wondered with you, I think, are you a ball buster? Being nice or a nice guy being a ball buster? I, I like to think the second. Good, but when guys are making money, you must a party. You must be like, oh, I want to the Italian, the fighter. Well, no. I, again, they they don't. I don't know this guy. But even publicly mocking, you must be like, oh, I want to hit back. Uh, even when you called guys, it was genuinely out of like. Well, if, if you talk to anybody I call, I never yelled at them. I never yeah. said, you suck, I'll teach you. You'll never do it. I never use that. You know who I am. That's my favorite thing. Whatever, <laughs> whenever a celebrity, do you know who I am? I don't know any celebrity that actually has ever said that, but they always quote it in yeah. magazines and stuff. And um, no, I, 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 and I became friends with a lot of guys who, because you're a kid, you're starting out, you think that's what you have to do. You have to trash somebody to get ahead, which I never quite get. You know, I mean, like when I do interviews, they, who don't you like? I don't want to talk about who don't yeah. like. I mean, just please, you know. Yeah, it doesn't serve. It's it. a hard business. Yeah. You know, everybody makes You're going to bump into reason. people. Well, yeah. So the stuff with Letterman, with the hindsight, what do you think looking back at it? 
Well, I don't was know. Was it a waste of time? Was it petty? Was it small? Do you wish you handled it differently? You know, I, I, I could say it was, but I probably do the same thing. I'm not sure what I did wrong. It started that, oh, I, I took The Tonight Show away from Letterman. He says he never had it. He never had it. Yeah. But, but the reason he didn't have it was because he was so good. Here's the thing. Johnny was on at 1130. David was doing better at 1230. I mean, he was killing, yeah. he was making huge money, all this kind of stuff. When, when, when I guest hosted, I got the same ratings as Johnny. Okay, so NBC said, whoa, we got a hit at 1130 with this new guy and Letterman's killing it at 1230. If we get rid of Jay, he'll go to ABC or CBS. We move Dave down. There's no guarantee he'll be a success. Let's keep Letterman where he was. And although although Johnny did want Letterman, uh, that was Johnny's choice. Johnny, that, it, the time slot belonged to NBC. Yeah. yeah. And, and Dave had kind of pissed people off a little bit too. But, all right, so I'll play this and just go ahead. stop it whenever you want. Uh, in my group, uh, the funniest was Jay. There, there were other people that would come in and uh, put on a better show, but just funny to funny, it was always Jay. What do you think of that, looking back on it? The rivalry and the late night wars and all that stuff. How do you categorize it in your mind? Well, it's um, overall, it's embarrassing because I don't want to be the guy who's uh, pissed off because, oh, I didn't get so-and-so uh, because I didn't truly feel that way. You oh, didn't feel that way? No, no. Thought? You know, I love Letterman. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not, and you probably know this as a comic, you go through life and when, when you're starting out and you meet people who just don't get you. I mean, they might get it a little bit, but you know, it's when it's like when you're dating a, and the girl goes, why do you have to do a set every night? What, why do you have to go to the club every night? Okay, get a new girlfriend, okay? Okay, because this is first. I'm sorry, girlfriend, you're second. You might tie it, but you're never gonna be in front of it, you know? And then you, you come to a place of comedy store, you meet Letterman, you meet Richard Lewis, you meet other people that really think like you and you form a bond. I could never dislike. I mean, was I hurt by a lot of things? Sure, sure. That's okay. But there's hurt nobody. in that in that like it was personal or hurt in like fuck. This is I, can't we we both have these amazing perches, like we're uh, we're both the top of the heap in show business. Can you know, we I just thought enjoy it, was, it? The thing I liked about it was I got the ratings. Dave got the critics, and that seemed fair. And and you know something, if you flipped it. That would be okay too. Mm -hmm. I would take either. I mean, I think we both did okay that way. But truly, one of the funniest people, and I felt he and I were the perfect foil for each other. Because any time spent with Letterman, I always left with more material than I came in with. Mm. In the sense that, oh, well, what's, what's the thing they said? Oh, yeah, you know, let's expand that. Yeah, you know, we would have a conversation and we'd both be laughing. And there was no greater joy than putting something in that Letterman genuinely laughed at. Because Letterman didn't always find things funny. I mean, one of, the, one of my favorite moments, there was a comedian named Fred Travellina. Do you remember mm -hmm. Fred? He, Vaguely. He was an impressionist. Yeah. But of the old school, you know, Tuxedo Vegas. Oh, here's Bob Hope at a party, you know. Like, yeah. Good kind. And he just hounded Letterman. Don't oh, put me on, put me on. Because we know, all, you know, all these things from the comedy store, you know, you feel guilty, you don't have. So Letterman puts him on. Yeah. And he sits down, Dave, how you doing? So and so. And Dave asks him a question. He goes, Dave, you know, with my crazy mind, and Dave, <laughs> you know my crazy mind. You see Lemon, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he's just so uncomfortable yeah. in this line of questions. Yeah. Anyway, with my wacky mind, you know how I think. And I, I'm just screaming laughing. Dragging him into his horrible setups. Yeah, yeah. Just It just made me laugh. And that was, we didn't have that when Dave and I got together. I would say something and he would say something scathy or snarky and I would try to come back with them. Oh, so it was, it was the greatest time in my career. It was the most fun on TV. I believe you. And what I'm curious about is as it got, you got bigger, he got bigger, rivalry, all that competition. Is there a party that feels like, uh, eh, shit, I wish it was still, we were closer, like the relationship maintain i don't know that. i i think if we ever did get together it would immediately go back to right what it was mm -hmm. you know like in 78 i mean i like 
I love comics. Yeah. You know, I'm not a religious person, but you know, if they stab me, I go, he still make me laugh, man. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, I mean, so it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. We have really nothing in common, uh, but cars, cars. Yeah. Yeah. And $500 million each. I think Dave's probably got a few bucks more than I okay. do. Five, five, five. Dave's got no, 580. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. But what I mean, you seem, you seem obsessed by wealth. It seems I, I do seem obsessed yeah, by wealth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Has it eluded you? You do pretty no, I good. Know. Right. Yeah, you do. It's right. fun though. Yeah. It's fun to talk about because the thing everyone pursues, no one can talk about. Right, and then when right. it's in the paper, how much you make, it's like, well, let's talk about right, it. Right, right. And it's one of those things. That's why I don't complain about anything. Like right. When I had my accidents, I just do jokes about it because people love to see rich people being set on fire. Okay. It's, it's really. You know, it's something yeah. they enjoy. So you joke about it, you make you make fun of it, you know. But was I hurt by the things that went on back and forth? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some were like, really? Okay. You know, I, I, I remember once his producer called me, this is when Dave had his heart attack. Mm -hmm. And they said, please don't say anything on The Tonight Show. I said, well, I, I just, please, you know, Dave, just don't. Just don't mention it. Don't say anything. Okay, okay. So I, I didn't, you know. And about 10 days later, the only one who never mentioned it was Leno. He never, I laughed. I walked into that. I got set up on that. Yeah. I just said, ah, ah yeah. stupid was I not to do that. Yeah. But that wasn't Dave. That was somebody on the show. But no, to this day, Letterman makes me laugh as much as anybody. Yeah. You know, fascinating character, funny. And there's a connection that we have that I can't describe. Oh. I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, ah. That's all right. But you know something? It's like sex. I don't care how it works. It works. Just leave it. You know, I, I like to make love. I don't want to be a gynecologist. Okay. It's a little, it's a little too complicated. <laughs> I don't know what this means, but I like it. Yeah. 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 That's what I mean. So, I mean, I always, I always like that. I mean, even when I went back to do the Oprah commercial with Letterman, that, that thing. You Were know? you guys on set the same day or they yes, shot separately? Same, no, same time. I flew in, Dave said, Jay, how you doing? Dave, how are you? We did our lines and then Dave left and we were there like a minute and a half, two minutes. But that was okay. That was okay. So it's like a, you consider him like a work friend of someone you're a fan of, actual friend back then, I mean. I don't know. You know, it's like if you've ever been in a plane crash with someone, you have a bond. If you've ever been in a car accident and the two of you pull each other out, I don't know. My success was hinged to his. Uh, I don't know if his was hinged to mine, but mine was hinged to his. And I'm always grateful for the the time I spent with. Those are the most fun part of my career because I could go on the Letterman show with something I thought of that afternoon and just do it. It was spontaneous. It wasn't rehearsed. Uh, we didn't have to run it past anybody. It just seemed to work because I knew, I just knew I could see how the, the wheels turning and I said, what Lennon was going to say about this? And I can always tell what I what, like with the super success magazine, when I caught him off guard, oh, there was nothing more fun to me. Nothing I enjoyed more ever yeah. than, than making Dave laugh. Yeah. It's, I wonder how it could have worked professionally if you're the host of Tonight Show, he's on after, or I guess on against, like, could you have maintained the relationship in any, in like, well, again, and, and be again, successful. Dave would be the guy and I would be the, if it was a comedy team, Dave would be the straight man and I would be the clown guy. I mm -hmm. mean, I would... It, you'd be the it, Dean it's, Martin. It's, or no, you'd be the Jerry Lewis. It's better if David was the host and I was the comic. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I remember Dave used to say to me, when I first saw Letterman in the comedy, so I walked and I said, I introduced myself and I said, man, great wordsmith. I like the way you put this together. But just talk about how he phraseology yeah. and whatnot. And he said to me, well, how can you just be so confident? You get up there and just, how can you just start yelling at people, you know? And because I, I, I wasn't as funny as I was loud. I was, hey, hey, no, hey nice to see you, pal. You know, just kind of, I didn't have a lot of jokes. But Letterman, oh, he, he liked that part of it. He, he, he wasn't outgoing in that way. And I liked his words. So I think we took a little bit from each other. I watched the way David phrased things. I said, yeah, I got to slow down and be more exact in how I, how I say things, you know? Yeah. And it's just one of them things. It's just one of those life things. 
Is that, you know, that, it's one of those life things. Yeah. I mean, if Letterman ever wanted me for anything, I would be there. I am eternally grateful. And I'm sorry it got so ugly. I don't think it ever got really personal, personal. It was mostly other people. You know, once Stern gets into it and anybody else, mm-hmm. they're all attacking you. and I say, But they was okay. They was okay. I mean, I, I, I got it. You know, the idea that I somehow took the show away from him, well, that never happened. David's own success kept him from getting the show because they wanted to keep 1230 a hit. You know, but when I talk to strangers, they think they was all set to step in. And then I came, I guest hosted for five years. I heard you, you stood in the door and said, but wait. Uh, yeah. But, but no, I guest hosted for five years before I even got the show. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And you're just like, ah, the sands of time or sands like. Of, <laughs> sands of time. <laughs> okay. How did you fall in love with Mavis and how did you not have kids? Oh, well, uh, I've lived with like five women. They're all born on the same day. Really? Mavis was, when I saw Mavis in the audience. Same year or same no, sign? No, same, same, same sign. And uh, I said, what's your birthday? She said, September 5th. I, go, oh. I remember I had Kathy Geiswhite. Do you remember her? Sounds she, you remember a comic Kathy strip Cartoon? called Kathy? Yes. Okay. She was on the Tonight Show. I find myself strangely attracted. I said, what are you addressing him? I said, look, I, I'm not flirting. I'm happily married. I, I wrote a date down on this piece of paper. Just take a look at that date and see if it means anything. And you asked volunteers, have we ever met before, sir? Have we, you did the whole magician I, I hadn't thing? Met before, no. And she turned it over. He said, oh, September 5th, that's my birthday. I went, okay, that's what I thought. Okay, I'd just taken a wild guess. And then I told her the story and I told my wife on September 5th. So that's your sexual orientation is September 5th? Uh, I just seem to be attracted to September 5th. Uh, my wife never wanted kids and it was fine with me. So that was all right. Oh, so you didn't, you weren't like, it wasn't, no, I don't there need, was no I tension? I don't need a little J. No, no, I'm fine. You know, she could go on the road with me. It was like you're on a date the whole time, you know, so. Meaning what? Well, what I mean is she's not home taking care of a kid and I'm in a club. Hey girls, how are you? Nice to right. see you. You know, I mean, as what happens. Uh, she had a dad that was in show business. He was not particularly successful, but he was a working. Was it Fred Travelina? No, no, a working <laughs> character actor. You know, so so she knew the life. And if we if I went to Hawaii for a gig, she went to me. So yeah, so and that to this day she, I was at Comedy Magic Club last night doing a benefit. She was with me. So and been and married forty three years. Forty three years. Is it still like a date? What's it? Is it still? I enjoy your company. You know, that's kind of all you can ask you, for. You know, I remember having a discussion with someone. This person said to me, oh, he met this girl, comic. He goes, she's crazy. She's really crazy, but the sex is unbelievable. It's going on and on about the sex. And I said, look, when the sex is over, she's still crazy. <laughs> so you have 23 hours of crazy until the, until the crazy wheel comes yeah. around again. You have 23 hours of crazy. Sit there and eat. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's when everything else happens. It just made me laugh. No, I enjoy our company. We have a good time. She understands what a good joke is. You know, I remember, we were, you know, we were lying in bed the other night, you know, just it's like two o'clock in the morning. She goes, I go, she goes, honey, I love you. I said, you're having a nightmare. Go back to bed. <laughs> right. And she fell out of bed laughing. And to me, as opposed to a woman who might get mad at that, but I just went, you're having a nightmare. She just, she thought that was <laughs> like the funniest thing. I went, oh, it's a pretty good line. I mean, she woke me up in the middle of the night. It's hilarious. You're just having a nightmare when you go back to bed. Um, did you learn anything from your recent accidents? No. And you no, said it wasn't the first. That's why they're called accidents. They're accidents. I didn't. If I was a Buddhist and I was setting myself on fire to protest some injustice, that would be one thing. But I just, it was just an accident. So what, you didn't crash for any kind of cause? Just uh, No, no. <laughs> no, my, what happened was I was on my motorcycle. I came around a corner and I crashed into Jeremy Renner's snowplow. That's so, it was just a, a bad. I didn't know that was a joke until, until you hit, until yeah, you yeah. hit me over the head with it. Yeah. Oh, here's a question. Okay. Did you like running a staff because you know by the way you still have a you still have a big you still do a lot of tv shows you still do 
I, how many I, of those the the I garage show to... episodes do you do? How I mean, many you've done? Uh, like hundred of them? It's five hundred or something? Oh no, we got a, well, we do fifty two a year, and I've been on for thirteen years. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, and then Seven, I do the Jay Leno's Garage Show that that was on CNBC. Now it will be on someplace else. We haven't found a home for it. Those are our episodes. The others are half hours. But what what was the question? Uh, and do you? How do you do you mind running a staff? Do you I I personally kind of find it stressful, but <laughs> you find everything stressful. I do. I should I don't do. find anything stressful. <laughs> no, I know that's interesting. No, stress you... is not a part of my you know why? Because it's all gravy at this point. You know, my parents saw me be successful. My parents died. I they didn't die in some uh, with me in some sort of shameful situation or being arrested. You know, they got to see me be successful. Yeah, I, you know, so Everything is 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 great at this point. I like I like having a staff. I I really enjoyed it. When I would hire writers, I hired them for a year. I didn't pick anybody up for th thirteen weeks mm -hmm. uh, because look, find your voice, just write anything, and just send me everything. So a lot of times people would send me material on the same, and each writer would think they wrote the joke. Well, they didn't really. Maybe it was my punchline and their setup or vice versa. And sometimes I wrote the whole joke, but a lot of times, so that way there was no stress. We had two teams. Some worked until from seven in the morning till like four o'clock in the afternoon. Then I had a second staff that worked to three or four in the morning. And I would get jokes from each side. And it worked out great. I hired writers by looking at material, not by name, not by seeing them, just send me material. And we wound up with four female writers and one guy that was so crippled with muscular dystrophy, but he could bang out a typewriter. Now, if that guy had been pushed into my office, I might not have hired him, but he had jokes that were funny. So I hired on the basis You of, would have discriminated against him if you had the chance. I don't know if I would have, but somebody, you know, but you know what I'm saying. No, I know what you mean, People yeah. go, oh, this guy, but he was funny, he was good. Banging on the typewriter is a little, I feel like that's a poor use. Of, <laughs> that's a poor use, that's, that's probably true. <laughs> poor use but, of But you know what I'm phrase. saying. But yeah. anyway, but anyway, uh, so it was okay. I liked it, we all got along pretty well. Didn't have any real problems. You know, anytime there's a problem, we just sort of stopped and dealt with it. Do you have a temper at all? No, no I don't, I don't, I don't have a temper. I, I have a temper if something is intolerant or something like that, but not if it's, Something to, I mean, I, I like to think I can, so what's the real problem here, you know? It doesn't seem that hard to me. You know, kindness goes a long way. If you're the first one in the office and the last one to leave, no one grudges you the 37 minutes, besides you, of course. No one grudges you how much money you're making if you appear to be working harder than yeah. anyone else. And that's, that's what Were I Were you conscious to, of that? Yeah, I took the smallest office. Like Debbie had the, the office with the bathroom and all this stuff. And people go, I want to go talk to Jay. They go, this is your office? Yeah, I just sit here and write jokes. That's all. Oh. And they were astounded they didn't have the big office because I had the same office as all the other writers. And the writers would walk by and just hand me jokes. We didn't have a writer. I guess we had a writer's room. And you would have writers. Jimmy Brogan would say that you'd be writing until you'd have them to your house. Yeah. Some writers would come over and we work from 10 to about 2 or 2.30. In the morning. Yeah. And I would try to have... 60% of the monologue together before I went to bed. Because you don't know if a plane crashes, well, there's your airplane hunk, take yeah. that out, you know, whatever it might be. So that was always, I would say most of the effort went into the monologue. Uh, I mean, I realized about five years in, there are only 18 guests in the whole world that mean anything. Mm. So rather than do a four and a half or five minute monologue, like they used to do in the old days, we stretched it out to 11 or 12 minutes. And that seemed to work. As long as the jokes kept coming, people, oh, oh well, I'm, I'm just gonna stay and watch. And by that time, we're into the next click on the rating period, so that helps. And are you pretty uh, accepting of the show, this, the the showbiz clock and like, all right, it's my time. I had like my thing and now I'll just do something else. You mean with, with the, the Tonight Show, like with the turnover of the jobs? Yeah, I mean, the Tonight Show ended on a Thursday night. Uh, Friday, I was in Florida at a gig. And, the, and you kind of were just like, yeah. This no, I was a stand-up comedian who was lucky enough to get a TV show. Sometimes it's only eight weeks. Sometimes it's a year and a half. I was lucky. It lasted 22 years. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. And you didn't, you weren't chomping at the bit or? No, I was never a guy that 
Yeah, I go to Spago. I'm saying, this used to be my table. What? What? what are you, I, that's what? That's my table. You know, no, yeah. I wasn't one of those guys. No. no, I never went to I didn't do any of that. All my meals came from people in paper hats. You know, I, 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 I didn't. I didn't want to live a show business lifestyle, you know. As you're saying all this, I'm like, I feel like you're more competitive, not in a good way. Like in a, I feel like you're like, you want to kill. Yes. You want to kill in every, and you want to be like, if there's a job you can have, you want the job. Yes. Like you are ambitious in a meritocracy. You want to like, I want to earn it. And then I want to be the best. Yeah. I think that's, that makes sense. Yeah. Because that's what the sort of, the Letterman and the Kimmel and all those guys get like the, the way I don't want to put words in them, but it seems like the implication is that you're very competitive. Yeah. But that's good. Isn't it? I, yeah. If I'm a, if I'm the buyer, if I'm the, you right, know what I mean? Like right, if I'm the, exactly. if I'm in the crowd. Right. Exactly. And you don't, and you just feel like, no, this is like, well, this is the rules of the game and let's yeah play hard. That's fine. I don't mind getting beaten by somebody that's better. You know, I, I mean, I was at the comedy side and I saw Ornie Adams. You ever seen Ornie? Mm -hmm, yeah. Really funny. Yeah. And he's a guy that's really grown into it now. Mm -hmm. And he had a bit that just killed me. And I, I walked out, I told him, I said, I'm so pissed that I didn't think of that because it was so funny and so smart. It's a bit about low T. You ever heard that? Bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I go, ah, that, that's right up my alley. How did I miss that? Uh, but I was glad for him. And yeah. I was glad that he was funnier than I was. And that, that's good. I, I don't mind getting beaten. You know, it's like losing a fight, but you put it like my dad, you know, <laughs> it's a good beating. Yeah. Well, that's okay. I stayed in the fight. Yeah, that's good. You did. You know? Yeah. But you can, it sounds like you can give a beating too. Like, you know, you can uh, take a beating, but once you got good well, at I hope it. So yeah. Yeah. Great. Oh, this is the thing I wanted to. Oh, how, 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 uh, well, you know, comedy, a friend of mine, was the uh we'll call him Seth Myers. Yeah. Said that you called him when he was the host of Weekend Update and told him why you liked his approach. You said when you don't like a joke, I can't tell. And you said when and then you went down all the other late night hosts and said when they don't like a joke, so and so looks up and to the right. Right. The level of mastery you have is incredible. Well, you know, it's, anything, when you, it's funny that you say that because when Letterman would do a slam at me, like I think Howard Stern was saying, you know, Leno steals all his jokes from me, you know, something. Yeah. And he, he said it once in the monologue, uh, Leno was stealing jokes from me, and his eyes went down, you know, and I realized, oh, I see Dave doesn't believe that. I could, I could tell. I mean, I, I could tell he was saying something that really wasn't, maybe I'm imagining it, but mm -hmm. really wasn't. And I, I, I can see that when somebody doesn't tell the truth, everybody has to tell, you know? Yeah. And with Seth, I could tell, I couldn't tell when he didn't like the joke, you know, but a lot of times. But you knew everybody else's tell. Yeah, well, because comics, if somebody else wrote the joke and it doesn't work, they want to distance themselves. Uh -huh. They say it and then. <laughs> You know, then they turn whatever it might be. But there's always something that they want people to know subconsciously that was not their job. They, they were yeah. doing it because it's part of the job. It was forced on them, whatever it might be. You know, but that's funny. Yeah, that was like Johnny. That's what was great at him. I mean, Chappelle one time said, you can tell how funny someone is by how they bomb. Right, yeah. And yeah. Johnny, like no one was better. Right, excellent. That's right. That's right. Um, all right, final question. No, final You're gonna question. You're going to hate it. You're going to hate it. Oh. I would like to give you credit for inspiring kind of a i do a joke about how dogs uh are hostages and you had a joke about was it the cat being finicky or the dog being finicky I, i'm good I'm you had a joke about uh the dog your wife said uh the cat won't eat the food we got her she's being finicky and you said well lock her in the closet for three days yeah. And let's see how finicky she is. <laughs> right, right. Oh, I do remember that joke. Yeah, yeah, that's it seems funny. more cruel than a joke. But yeah, <laughs> and, and what's the and what's the? No, you inspired. First of all, no, it's you know it's funny. It was funny. You did it in the eighties. I remember. Right, right. You were. I'm trying to prove that you were a headliner that you would okay. have enjoyed. Now you were a critic of me in the early days, correct? No, no? I never was. No, oh, I've I, literally I was... never. I've always oh. just thought 
you were like a great com- I knew I remember when you were a comic. So when you were doing the Tonight Show, I never I was never I kind of understood what you were doing. It was amazing how people just you just get swamped with it was just unbelievable just uh, yeah it, it, it was it was it was a fascinating experience was it like wow this what did it feel like entirely you know heavy lays the head that wears the crown or was it well i think three times i was in the top 100 most influential people type of thing um and we would get jokes every week in the new york times that they put out of the monologue you know, I, I, I didn't think, I I thought, like, I always had a smart joke and then a, a silly joke. You always want to have something for everybody in there, you know? Yeah. When times are serious, uh, you you did silly jokes. When times are silly, you did serious jokes, you know? Mm. And But I always tried to have the monologue, you put it together like a newspaper. You start with the headline of the day, and by the time you get to the end of the monologue, it's like the funny page. You're just doing silly things. So it's so and so. And when I got picked on, it was always for the silly things. But we got quoted more than almost anybody for the political jokes we did at the time. Um, well, yeah, but uh, they didn't. They didn't act like they were smart. Huh? The you would do the same political, but it just it didn't seem because it was you're affable. So it seems like oh, Jay's sort of mild and doesn't have a strong opinion. But it's like yeah, you have a strong opinion. Anybody that's paying attention can tell. Yeah. You know, I mean, but that's really the key to it. I mean, that's why everybody that does a talk show now, you're always losing 50% of the audience because you're giving away all your, you know, I used to do these uh, things with um, Colin Powell. I'd go out and do like 20 minutes of stand-up, then I'd bring him out and I would interview him. And it would be like at colleges, you know, yeah. these kind of things. And he, he told me he, he didn't run for president because the minute he did, every day he would lose another half of the audience, another chunk because he didn't believe this, he didn't believe that. Yeah. You know, Mother Teresa was against abortion, hated it. Well, they'd be picketing her today. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, so a lot of times, so you, you, to show all your cards doesn't necessarily seem like the smartest thing when you're a business like television, which has a mass appeal. You know? Yeah. And I never, I'm trying to think of like, did I ever criticize? I, I really, and in fact, Chappelle used to be on the your on the Tonight yeah, Show. Yeah, we had him on, and it was helpful. It like was helpful to the to getting the show and starting the show. So like, right. well, like I, I, I love Dave. He was. Yeah. I thought he was just the best. Yeah, yeah he he is. So so uh, so yeah, I'm I'm I would have to think about it, but I've always had like a. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just saying. No, because I'm trying to think. I'm like, because well, you're don't a wanna... smart guy. So I thought no, no, no. You, you'd, <laughs> probably, you you'd probably be in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is the <laughs> other thing that impressed me is when we met, we met a couple of years ago and you knew you watch every stand up special. I see a lot of them. I, I, I'm a little tired of, the, you know, the first one's always good. The second one is, hey, buddy from Denver. Yo, Denver. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! And yeah. okay, I got 59 minutes. You know, I, pep rally. I, yeah, I'm just, I've never done one because I, you're now a victim. It's on your permanent record. That's an interesting reason to not do one because it'd be a good payday. Well, or you could do 10 one nighters and make the same money and own, yeah. and own your act. You know, a lot of times people come and they go, ah, oh, I, I saw a year ago, you got all new stuff. No, I don't. You just have yeah, a bad forgot. memory. You know, you just forgot. And it comes every six to nine seconds, there's a joke and you're moving quickly. When it's on TV, if you're in town tomorrow night, I'm going to watch your three specials. And if you do anything in that live show that's on the special, I feel ripped off. Yeah. First of all, you're not going to remember. You're going to remember, you're only going to remember three bits from an hour anyway. Right. right. Tops. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. But yeah, that's, I'm always impressed with your, it's like, in like real, into like, real into the like rock said one time I, it's in seinfeld's movie that when when you guys were at comedy magic and it's you and shanling and right. rock and seinfeld and rock's always like jay was like the 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 grown-up in that room <laughs> <laughs> okay here's the question all right well all right i want it before we go on all right i want to know more about the criticism because I, I feel like there's something there, how you were like, wow, all these people have turned on me. Did it feel disloyal? Did it feel it surprised you? 
Did it feel like? Well, it surprised you, Mike. Of course it does, because you, you have an opinion of yourself, and you're surprised when people think completely the opposite, and you go, "Yeah, wow, how did I not?" And you question your, "How did I not see that coming? How did I not know where there's smoke, there's fire?" You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. So it was. It was. I, I mean, I, I I'd like to think I'm pretty thick skin, but yes, yeah, some of it was hurtful. But usually it was from people I didn't know. It wasn't coming from internally. Oh, yeah, we work with Leno on the Tonight Show. And he's awful. And I, it wasn't that. It was people that don't know you. You know, like I was giving, I was giving out donuts at the, uh, at the Strikers. Yeah, the Writers Guild on uh, Strike. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and Leno pulls up a hundred thousand dollar Tesla with thirty, thirty dollars worth of donuts. Screw you, Jay Leno. You're, well, am I supposed to sell my car now? Or am I to, yeah. No, I just handed out donuts. I wasn't. I yeah. Just, guys, here's some donuts. But just people furious, you know? Yeah. Or, or people think that you, I'm doing this game show, you bet your life, you know? And we, we took it off because of the writer's strike. You know, okay, well, it's solidarity. I believe in all that. But I'm not in charge. I, I work there. So there's a payroll company that pays residuals. I'm reading this. Jay Leno pay us the residuals you owe us. I didn't even know what this guy was talking about. And I called and it turns out, yeah, the payroll company is behind and uh, okay. But you know, they're blaming me. I have nothing to do with that. Yeah. That's the kind of ones where you feel like, I don't mind if I did something, I, I'll take the credit for it or the blame, but I, I, this has nothing to do with me, you know? Yeah. Those are the ones that kind of get you. Yeah. Well, that's the, yeah, the stuff that's like, and do you, were you able to quickly think, this is not about me. It's about the position. Yeah, yeah, I, I get it. I'm that. the. I empathize with the people because I've been in that situation. But I'm talking about criticism from comics, like the criticism from the time the from the '90s, all that comics and. I, part of me, I don't know if I wouldn't have taken a swing at somebody. Well, I mean, there is a little bit of that Italian Alzheimer's. Yeah, you forget everything but a grudge. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking. Yeah, there you go. There yeah. You go. So that's why you know I I remember I don't necessarily hold it against people, but I I always remember like with uh, oh the comic that talks uh, Bobcat. Yeah. I, for some reason, Bobcat comes on the Tonight Show with a can of lighter fluid. Do you remember this? Yeah. And he sets a couch on fire. Okay. And uh, okay, well, I put it out. Okay, fire marshal comes over, after, furious, wants him arrested. Just da 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 da, you know. And I said, no, no. And I, I, I mean, this guy is screaming. I calmed him down. I said, look, Bob Castle. So I don't think he meant anything. Da 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 da. I mean, I defended him. I kept him being arrested. And then I hear him on Stern all this Leno, fucking pussy ass Leno. Da, da, da. I go, really? Do you think that was funny? Setting the couch on, I mean, everything is paper. The whole thing, yeah. the whole studio could have gone up, you know? And I go, really? All right. And I, I don't think I've spoken to him since. Not, I just haven't been in the same yeah, room yeah. with him, right? But I was, I just thought, really? I mean, I mean, I kept you from being arrested. <laughs> uh, you know, I intervened on your behalf. Uh, and I, those are the kind of things I, don't, I didn't understand. Like, why would you not say, hey, Jay, thanks for covering my ass? Like, yeah, no problem, man. It was a stupid thing. Yeah, I know it was stupid. Oh, okay, fine. That's that's what I really thought would happen. Yeah. And then I find myself uh, being castigated. Because, oh, it, it was really funny. And you, oh, all right, okay. You know, yeah. Just no, that's what I'm curious about. Yeah. Is like it 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 penetrated and it was like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, it, it gets to you. But there's a little Nietzsche in here too, you know. You got to, what doesn't kill you does make you stronger. Yeah. You and know? you believe that as like an ethos. Oh, yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. Like when I got set on fire, I went, this is bad. It's not when bad. When Bobcat set you on fire. No, no. When I, got, when I got set on fire, I went, it's bad, but it's not that bad. It, I don't it, take painkillers or anything like that. I said, pain is there for a reason. It's supposed to teach you a lesson. Uh, and okay. Yeah. And you, and you, that seems to be like your number one. Like you don't feel if you feel sorry for yourself, it's not for more than like a split second. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, and you if and that. and you think it's like from the from you were always like that. Yeah, I've always been that way. I think you know. And plus, look, I'm a real. I'm very lucky. I've been way more successful than I than I ever thought would happen. So at this point, it's all gravy. So if it blows back in your face, okay. 
That's all right. That's fine. I don't feel sorry for myself. I don't sit home and go, oh, why didn't I get this? Like, yeah, it went pretty I mean, well. Yeah, yeah. I don't, you know, by your own admission. What is it, 37? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, 37 a year from what I, from what Jay Leno told me he made. All right. Movie of your life. The Jay Leno story. What's the arc? Who plays Jay Leno? I have no idea. Fred Travelina. <laughs> I have no idea who plays Jay Leno. What's it about? What was this all about? Favorite movies. Oh, almost all black and white. Requiem for a Heavyweight uh -huh. with Anthony Quinn. Yep. The first, I saw the movie when I was 10. That was the first empathetic movie I ever saw. Meaning? Where, meaning that, did you ever see the movie? Yeah. So we, yeah, we watched it in film school. When he fact. goes into and he talks to the woman about working in, a, I, was, I was number, number five in the world. <laughs> and you just, you just feel for this guy. Yeah. Okay. You know, just uh, the first one that yeah. just like, oh, yeah. face in the crowd. You ever see face, in, face the in the crowd is anyone who hasn't seen it is doing themselves a disservice. Even if you hate black and white movies, even if you hate old movies, I don't even know how you can it's, hate black and white it's, movies. I mean, cause if you it, grew up in color, it's the greatest movie. It's so cynical. And Andy Griffith is, you want to talk about a hundred and, I mean, d d driving a million miles. You can't believe how good he is. I, you know, it's why I, I never bought Dustin Hoffman as Lenny because he was always an actor in that. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a comedian. Andy Griffith was a comedian in this, in, in the sense. And when he played that, you know, when he does that whole thing where he, he's just the sleaziest guy and he, he gets a radio show and he goes, you know, men think you women just put a little water over a dish and that's all you do all day. They don't know you're scrubbing the floor and doing. He's he he just milks in it. it, it, it that's just the the greatest showbiz, movie, the greatest movie. Uh, Godfather, of course, obviously you got to go for that one. That's a, and that's the color one. Um, Twelve Angry Men, great. Twelve black and white, yeah. another great black and white movie. Yeah, just unbelievable. So we got Twelve Angry Men facing the crowd. Oh. Miracle on 34th Street. Miracle on 34th Street because it's the only Christmas movie that gives you a logical reason why the man is Santa Claus. Because everyone, it's just magic. Yeah. But in this one, you got this old man, they got him on trial for being Santa Claus, you know, and da, 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 da. And then Jack Albertson in his first acting role ever, it's the post office, he's got all these letters to Santa. What do you got to these letters? Take a dead letter. They're all filled down there. Hey, wait a minute. They got Sandy Claus on on trial down there. To send them down the courthouse. So the lawyer goes in. If no other authority, if an authority as prestigious as the United States Post Office recognizes this man as Santa Claus, that he, and then he said, I, I thought it was just great. The greatest, and come watch this movie. He's a kid. I want. Well, how do you, how are they going to justify? He's not really Santa Claus. But he becomes Santa Claus by edict of the United States government. I thought, yeah. I thought it was the greatest ending ever. Just yeah, just, yeah, make because logical and it, yeah. as good as the Bob Newhart waking up in the bed next to yes. Him, yeah. You're, you know what your dad was good teaching you? Dodging, dodging, <laughs> dodging questions. Oh, what was this? The question, question is, oh, what? Oh, I thought I what thought that was, was this Jay Leno movie uh, life all about? What was the st what's the story arc? I don't know. I don't care. You know, I'll give you an example. Okay. I'm in Vegas one day. I'm at, it was the Hilton then. And I see these two guys, and they have a six foot cardboard cut out of Elvis. One guy's holding the head, the other guy's walking, got the feet. As they walk by me with this, and I said, Hey, what are you guys? Uh, oh, you put an Elvis thing in? He goes, Putting it in? No, we're taking it down. Nobody knows who Elvis is anymore. I went, Oh, okay. Well, so much for legacy. Thank you. And I went, well, Yeah. So when people say, well, how do you feel about, I don't know, I don't care. While I'm here, it's been a great ride. It's been a lot of fun. I enjoy it. But to have the audacity to think, well, I'd like this to go on long after I'm dead. No, no, no. I'm not even talking about like, no. what do you think? Do you believe in like a God thing? Like is it, what do you, what's your sort of, what do you think this was a, like, what did you overcome? What did you, <laughs> it was like a movie. Not about what are they, I don't, not, it's not about worshiping Jay Leno. No. It's just about like, what was the. What's the story? I have no idea. And you and and it seems like you just not. I, I, it's I, none of your business. I just don't have any interest in it, really. <laughs> yeah. If I I should spend my time trying to think of something funny, as opposed to gee, what would 
who would play me? Oh. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no. yeah no, but, that's it. I, yes. But you're yeah. misunderstanding me. What I'm saying is like, what did you, what did you get out of this, the, out of life? Oh, you know, you know something. I saw a commercial on TV the other night. I so missed the point of this commercial. A guy's like in a rugged place, like on the, what's that place in Chile? Missy Chupi. What's that? What's that mountain? Um, uh, is there a is there a casino? No, no, it's not a casino. No, it's uh, Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu. Yeah. Uh-huh. And he say, he said, "What are you going when you die? What are you going to think? What I could have bought, or where I could have gone?" I'm thinking, well, I know I would have bought that. Uh, and I went, "Oh, I would like to have bought." I went, "Oh, I missed the whole point of it." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I was thinking I should have got that Corvette. Uh, you just bought how many cars have you bought? I, I got two hundred four on the road. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, yeah. But I, it, I just missed the whole point yeah. of it. So I don't. Th- like, that's the thing is I don't think you're like, bullshitting. I think you're like it's just like you're, this is your orientation of life, and this is how you see shit, and you just yeah. I mean, you know, you have certain codes that you live by that don't always make sense. And if you follow them, you know, it's like if a guy takes dice and he keeps throwing them with a thousand other people, at the end of the day, only one guy is going to be left standing. And that guy's going to think, wow, I must be really special. No, you're not. You're just really, really lucky. So I've never got to the point where I thought I was special. I just thought I was lucky at throwing dice. It just happened. And also you're lucky to have uh, the ability to, Right. Right jokes. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, assuming that part of it, you know. You know, I have a good support system. I got the same friends I had in high school. I've been married the same woman for 43 years. It, it's all, it's it's great. So when these outside forces attack me, I, I don't, it doesn't bother me. You know, when I was a kid, I could never watch shows like Maud because they were always screaming at each other in the house. We never fought inside my house when I was a kid. And my wife and I don't fight. So to me, once I'm at home and I shut the door, all that is outside. It, it, it doesn't bother me. I never bring my work home. My wife would say, hey, what's this in the paper about you and Letterman? Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. I mean, I, we didn't even discuss it because when I'm home, that, that's where it is, you know. And so when you say, like whenever, whenever I see people fighting and they're married, it's like, oh, it just makes me really uncomfortable because... That's at your core. You, 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 you're going down now as opposed to having a fort, you know? I have a fort. The people I grew up with, parents, wife, you know what I'm saying? Does that make any sense? No, yeah. I, you're, not, you're not neurotic. You're just not a neurotic person. You're not, no, I'm not neurotic. You're at not. All. You, you just are like living a life and you're not thinking about why and the, you're not questioning that. and que- like no. You're just going forward. Yeah. You're plowing ahead. You're plowing ahead. Yes. As the sands of time. Plowing ahead. Uh, thanks for coming, buddy. Thanks. I appreciate it. Was it was great to have you. Very good, good man. Good being ahead. <laughs>